I am Twitter. Uh, I am. I am on Twitter. <laughs> I am Twitter. From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker, and I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. Okay, well, welcome to the show. Today we have someone quite special here, and it's actually a topic that I've been very interested to talk about, and we've actually had quite a few folks ask us about this. Uh, it's basically about cross-platform development, uh, and I would like to welcome Joseph here. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Joseph, can you give the listeners who may not be familiar with you uh, or your background, uh, kind of who you are, what you're working on, what you've worked on in the past, and so forth? Yeah, sure. Uh, so very brief background. I work for Microsoft now um, after having um, uh, the company I helped co-found, Xamarin, acquired by Microsoft. Uh, we created Xamarin as a, as a company focused on mobile development, cross-platform, of course. Um, but, uh, but I think the thing that was, was special for us was, um, was understanding that, yes, people needed to create cross-platform apps, um, but they needed to create native apps as well. Um, and, and I think that turned out to be the, the thing that came, gave the company legs. Um, but, but of course my background before that is, is as a C-sharp developer and a member of, uh, the open source community and, uh, and Xamarin itself was, uh, was taking the, the open source mono technology and enabling people to write C-sharp Excellent. applications. So you used to do .NET, uh, as we had discussed prior in the show, and, and C-sharp and so forth. And then you kind of mentioned cross-platform development with Xamarin. So there are a lot of folks here on the, the Fragmented podcast. Our uh, audience is mainly Android engineers, uh, highly focused directly into that. We do get a lot of questions about cross-platform development. There's a bunch of different tools out there, like Xamarin, like React Native. Some people use Cordova. Some people use who knows what nowadays, a bunch of different stuff. But for folks that aren't familiar with what Xamarin is, if you could you know, if, if we're in an elevator together, what would you say Xamarin is to explain it to another engineer? Why? Maybe they want yeah, to use absolutely. it. Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, uh, Xamarin culturally, we've always been focused on letting developers do uh, with C Sharp anything that uh, developers could do with Objective-C, Swift on iOS, or with Java on Android. Okay. Um, so, um, so the idea is... Um, you know, uh, basically a 100% mapping of Android APIs um, to to C Sharp and the ability to use things like native Android layout, XML and Android resources and and, and libraries even, um, but with the C Sharp programming language. And of course, the, the, the benefits of that are obvious if you're a C Sharp developer already, but even if you're not having a, a language that is um, that is powerful, but also available on iOS, available on Windows, available uh, on web servers, so that you can um, start sharing code. Um, it's nice because you don't have to rewrite code, but also because you can avoid bugs by, um, you know, by not writing a bug on one platform, and then finding out months later, you also have the same bug on the on a different code base on another platform. So, so what you're saying is I can use C Sharp to develop Android apps, uh, and you also mentioned iOS. Does that mean I can just write the code once and it's just, I just compile it and then I just get two outputs and it's, it's just one app or do I have to code for each individual platform? You can share code, but you're writing at the end of the day, you're writing a native iOS app or you're writing a native Android app. Like his, historically speaking, like where we came from, how, you know, how, how we got to be here is, is we started by putting C sharp on, on iOS. Yeah. Right? We wanted, we wanted to, to enable developers that were asking us, you know, windows developers at the time, Hey, I need to get to iOS, you know, can you help me do it? And the temptation was there to just give them all of the APIs they had on Windows to make ugly Windows apps running on iOS. And we didn't want to do that. We want to let people make great iOS apps. So, um, you know, so, so, so we first produced the iOS product. And, and, you know, at first people would ask us about Android. And we're like, well, it's, you know, it's Java. Java's, it's enough like C Sharp. Just, just use Java. Why do you want that? But, but that's when these forward thinking developers would say, well, it's, it is about, these advantages of using a single language and um and visual studio is a great ide and i and i want to be able to um you know to leverage all these other benefits of this ecosystem um so yeah so it was sort of from that deciding point that tipping point at the very beginning that we said oh this is actually it resonates with developers not being right once run anywhere and to actually be um you know 
to be native first, but also with cross platform capabilities. So if we were to dig a little bit deeper into the weeds here, let's say that I wanted to develop an application, uh, or this actually happens quite a bit, is a upper management hears about how great cross-platform development is because it's going to save a lot of money in the future. They have to kind of write it one language and, and so forth. Um, if I wanted to do that with, with Xamarin and I wanted to build in a iOS app and an Android app and have some, you know, share some code between them, what does that look like from a de- developer perspective? Do I... Do I have different projects in GitHub or do I just have one big project where I have shared code or, or what is that, you know, if we dig a little bit down into the details? Right. So in Visual Studio, with their build system, you have the concept of a solution, uh-huh. right? And the solution has multiple projects in it. You have essentially the same, you know, that, that same model inside inside Android Studio, of mm-hmm. course. Um, but um, but in the, case of, um, in the case of working with Xamarin, uh, you would have a head project for each platform that you're targeting. So you might, you'll have a project for your Android specific code and a project for your iOS specific code, and you'll have a shared project, like you said. Oh, Uh, okay. So you can share libraries. um, You can write libraries to share. You can use other libraries that people have written that are, that are cross platform. Um, So, so you might end up with multiple, multiple projects of shared code within, within your solution. Um, And, uh, and we also have a, a, a library called Xamarin Forms which is a toolkit that is a, it's a, it is a, an abstraction focused on some kinds of, of UI sharing. And, uh, and so you could share some UI code as well, but typically, you know, you're going to have a, you're, you're going to have a project with code specific to each platform that you're going to target. So I'd have like, like that shared, you, you mentioned the shared libraries or multiple shared projects inside of there. That's maybe where I'd keep like, you know, pertinent business logic that applies to across all projects. Is yeah. that correct? Right, right. So the, you know, so the model ends up being, um, you know, you're thinking, oh, well, how much do I really share? Do I even need to share? I'm writing, you know, I'm writing code. Let's say you're doing, uh, you're doing an app that's going to render some financial calculations, yep. right? So you actually have some logic to to create amortization tables, and you're going to render those on the phone. And if you did that on the web, you would just do it all on the web, right? Yep. But um, you wouldn't want to just run those calculations on the device. You can't trust <laughs> those calculations ran on the device, right? You're actually going to want to run those calculations locally on the device so that the user can quickly see, you know, have a responsive experience of, of, of code actually running on the device and mm-hmm. see, you know, what, what the models are going to look like or what the final costs are going to be. And you're going to run that same business logic on the server. Okay. Right. Um, because you're going to trust the models that ran on your server, or maybe they'll be more complex mm-hmm. you know, or they'll feed into other processes over there. So yeah, so there's, there's, you know, there's that kinds of business logic sharing that's server to cloud. And then there's also code sharing when you have ideas like authentication, like you know, maybe you have 10 apps or you have an, an app on iOS and Android, but they're always running against the same user password, login system, granting authorization. Same API. Right. So, you know, so you, you have that, that kind of logic in a in a library that ends up getting used across apps or if you're in a large organization you know maybe other 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 parts of the orgs are using those those same components in their apps as well so to kind of bring it full circle we kind of at the bottom we have this we'll just kind of keep it simple we have one shared library maybe that's where we have all of our authentication logic and where we're going to build those amortization tables and any other financial things that we're, we're mainly going to work on and then on top of that we have our we have the you know you know xamarin for android and xamarin for ios and, and so forth mm-hmm. that sit on top of that that talk to those same shared, shared libraries so that as a developer, I kind of have to write that code once, I unit test it, whatever, it's good to go. Now I know that it works and it's going to work the same on both platforms because both the same platforms talk to that same shared library, right? Right. And, and importantly, if you find a, a problem with your model and uh-huh. you go and you change it and you fix it, um, you know that you fixed it on on both platforms. And if you're working in a single solution and you change an API on your shared code, mm-hmm. um, you know, you know, you kind of have feet, you have feedback right away in your iOS and your Android project that those guys are still building. You didn't really break anything um, that uh, um, that both apps are depending on. Mm-hmm. Now, all this, I think, just to make sure we're clear with the listeners is all of this is, is written in C Sharp, right? Like top to bottom, Xamarin is Correct. all C Sharp. Yeah. So when I talk about like Android specific code, we expose all of the Android APIs as C Sharp code. Okay. So you have an Android specific project in your solution. Mm-hmm. You're writing all that code in C sharp. Now, the exception is that you're also using Android XML for layout, yep. right? Yep. Um, 
So if you had other tools or you were using other tools out there for processing Android layouts, yep. you would have access to all those same things. But we're not asking you to write Java code. You can. You can bind Java code. You mm -hmm. can bind on, on the iOS side. You can bind Objective-C code. You can bind C code. Like all of that stuff is available to you, but but we're giving you the ability to just write C sharp. Okay. So that's, that, that, I mean, you bring up a very good point there because in, in Java and actually in all languages now, we have a very big open source, you know, community with tons of platforms and libraries available to us, especially in Android. Every project, if we look at our build.gradle file, has a ton of dependencies that we're pulling in from logging libraries, API libraries, everything. If I want to continue using those libraries, I'm already kind of familiar with because they do a great job. Can I continue to use those libraries? Yeah, absolutely. You can. Now, they don't become inherently cross-platform when you do that. Mm -hmm. It's not like you opt into Android. I'm um, sorry, you opt into Xamarin and now your Android jar files are able to be used in your Xamarin iOS app. But by all means, yeah, you can use um, any any of the of the Android libraries you were using before. OK. Um, you know, occasionally customers will opt if it's an open source library to to port from Java to C sharp because that's fairly straightforward. Yeah. You know, so it is that, you know, that's also an option, too. And maybe that would give you the ability to to make that code more portable to iOS you know, moving it, but you don't have to. And, and in fact, even some of our customers um, that, that maybe have decided that they're going to move to Xamarin for whatever reasons, but they have an app written in Java, mm -hmm. they might just take a big chunk of that app and compile that as a jar and just keep it as is and just start building new code in, in C sharp, you know, tomorrow and, and not necessarily mess with the, the job, the working Java code they already have. Which is important because a lot of, a lot of teams that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis will build a lot of Android custom views that do a specific thing in Android that we don't really want on iOS, or it's not even iOS specific. We want, you know, uh, floating action buttons and material design things that we've built custom. So it sounds like I can actually definitely pull those in and just use that in the Android version yeah. of it. Yeah. And like I said, it's sort of a gradient. You can pull those in and make them as as Xamarin specific as you want mm -hmm. or, or just, you know, bring them in and, and leave them as is. Yeah, Cause I think what a lot of people, when they hear about Xamarin are, are afraid of, of, of leaving everything that they know to kind of bring over and to hop over to something like Xamarin, because, well, I know all these libraries and now I'm going to hop over here and I can't use them. But knowing that you can still use those libraries, I think is a, is a big win. Yeah. You can both use those libraries or you can, I mean, and, and this has historically been in, in the case of .NET and Java, constantly you can find you know the same libraries or forks of the yes. same libraries and ports of the same libraries but at the same time yeah just being able to make it easy to consume the libraries as is 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 always been a top tenant for us um so yeah it's it's really you know you might start with one approach and switch to the other too so it's 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 very easy to ease yourself into it now you guys have you're basically writing C sharp and you're able to talk to all the, I don't know if you want to call them bindings or whatever they are, the Android bindings, and iOS bindings, but let's say I'm building the Android app. Uh, how do you, how is that bridge made from writing C sharp to actually getting a native Android application? What happens and, and how is that maintained? Um, right. So, um, so at the end of the day, um, Xamarin uses a, uh, uh, a runtime okay. that is, um, you know, it's the mono runtime at the core of it um, that uh, that turns. Um, well, we compile C sharp to an intermediate language okay. like bytecode. Java yeah. compiles to, to Java bytecode, and and C sharp compiles to IL. And um, and on the end, in the case of Android, um, that IL is turned to ARM executable. What is IL for for folks that may not they're coming from the Java world? Right, that's the the intermediate language. So it's it's very much like bytecode, but um, you know, C sharp compiles to that. And okay. F sharp compiles to that, but it's the job of the uh, on iOS, uh, sorry, on Android, the the JIT to just in time turn that that intermediate representation to actual native ARM executable. So it's truly native. It's not like I'm running a web view inside of my. Correct. Right. Yeah. And then and then when we talk about these bindings, what we're really saying is we're talking about J and I with that. So it's you know it's a bridge and. Um, and the .NET code is running, you know, beside the Java code. We have uh, we have cooperative GC garbage mm -hmm. collector to make sure that you know when you dispose of of an uh, an object on the Java side, it goes away on the .NET side, and vice versa. Is there any per performance implications of doing that? That was what I was about to say. Uh, there is a performance implication of speaking across the bridge. Yeah. Right. So if you were in a you know if you were in a tight loop, you know, creating 
uh, an Android button mm -hmm. and like if you wanted to make a list and you were going to do it in a really odd way, you might stack a bunch of buttons up and you're creating all of them. Um, so there's, there's an additional cost of, of doing that. Um, but on the flip side, we have a very high performance JIT. So when, in the case of writing, like just comparing strict C sharp, that's not speaking across the, the bridge to strict Java, uh, we perform at least as well. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have specific benchmarks in front yep. of me, but there's even places where, um, you know, there, there are certain pieces of C sharp code that would actually perform better uh, on that side. Typically there's, I just wouldn't really consider that you have a performance cost for choosing to use C sharp. It, it really, it comes to light when you're doing something the wrong way. Like I just described where you're just doing a lot of cross talking from C sharp okay. to Java that you probably shouldn't be. And you just would just take a different approach. Does the same thing happen for, for iOS is the same type of thing um, for yeah. the, the JIT and so forth or what? No. no so it's not JITed. Um, Apple doesn't allow that. So when we talk about JIT, we're talking about just in time mm -hmm. uh, conversion of this intermediate representation to the, the, the arm executable code. And that can happen on Android. Um, that's, that's perfectly allowed. Yep. And basically you, you generate some code you're going to execute and then you make it executable and you, and you run that code. And on iOS, that's not allowed as a security restriction. In when you, when you start writing the memory, you're not able to make that memory executable, which means you can't have a JIT on the device because you could certainly generate oh, all the mm -hmm. code, but iOS is never going to let you execute that, that arm code okay. once you've generated it. So we have ahead of time compilation on iOS. And um, RAOT uses LVM, which is which is yep. an, an optimizing compiler. Um, it is the same backend for Objective C and, and Swift. Um, so you know, at the end of the day, we're generating the same ARM code that you would generate from Objective C uh, or Swift. But uh, but it's all generated ahead of time on your you know on your Mac before it's compiled into your into your app that you ship. Now, if I'm writing, let's, again, let's go back to so, just kind of really hopping into the weeds here. I'm writing an app. I'm in there. I said, you know what? I need to put a text box on this Android form. Uh, and then I need to get a reference from it. And so in Android, we normally do things like find view by ID. And we get the, we get a reference to that and we can kind of work with it. Um, if I'm doing this in Xamarin, am I working with a .NET text box? Or am I working with the Xamarin representation of an Android text box? Um, you are working with, well, you're, you're going to be speaking directly to the Android okay. text box. So it'd be like right? a text viewer or whatever, an edit text or yeah, something like that. Yeah, and you would use, I mean, it, you would do exactly what you said. It's, it's fine by D. It's the exact same thing. You have okay. the same resources file that, um, you know, that, that gives you the same handles, um, you know, the same IDs. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, that model would pretty much be instantly familiar to any Android developer because it's the same. And, and going back to what I said earlier with Android XML layout. Um, you know, that's going to be the same. So we still write our layouts in XML then? Correct. Oh, okay. So it's, and, and from my personal experience being a, a previous C sharp developer, uh, I can, I know from experience that making that the change from C sharp to Java and, and vice versa is actually quite easy because the languages are, are very similar. Mm -hmm. Um, and personally, uh, I actually prefer C sharp, which might come to shock to a lot of the listeners right now, but I actually prefer the language. I think it's a beautiful language. Uh, I know Kaushik, which is a co-host. He also loves C sharp mm. and feels it's a very beautiful language. So uh, that's one thing that I definitely miss about working inside of Java for you know the last almost eight years is having access to that beautiful language, uh, C sharp. And Xamarin gives you that ability, it seems like. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at C sharp, you know, earlier versions of C sharp, which is probably when a lot of Java developers you know, who, who, who've been around for a while doing Java, looked at C-sharp and kind of made their, their decisions and their assumptions about what the languages were going to be like. They look very similar, but yeah. actually C-sharp has evolved quite a bit. Oh, yeah. um, Java has even evolved to, to pick up some of the idioms from, from C-sharp. Um, and and C-sharp continues to evolve. So they, you know, they bring in nice features like async. And, yeah, that's a beautiful one. So, um, yeah, so I mean, you know, I'm biased towards C sharp, and and people are, but at the same time, um, you know, they, there is a common heritage. I mean, they're clearly inspired by the same C type constructs with semicolons and and curly braces. But yeah, I mean, you know, typically people give it an objective look, and uh, you know, first off, it's 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 something you can get comfortable with very very quickly, and um, and moving the other direction is fine as well. Though you're going to miss those fe those features that uh, that you got that you got used to on the C sharp side. Yeah, when I came over to, to Java, I the first thing I looked for was I had a I had a 
I think it was an array list of something and and I went to go use a, a lambda expression and it just wasn't there. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that was and I, I found myself writing so many verbose for loops and so forth. So uh, I, I can definitely relate. But let, let's let's take this in a little bit different direction here. With Android, we have releases all the time of new operating systems uh, that get released, uh, Marshmallow N, and et cetera, and they keep coming out, and they will hopefully keep con- coming out. When a new version of Android is coming out, either, either if it's developer preview or it's just being released, how does that get into Xamarin? So if I'm using Xamarin, I can actually use those new APIs. What's that look like? Right. So we um, we have a, a team of engineers that every time there's a preview of a new a new Android release, mm-hmm. um, you know, we download it and start creating bindings right away. We have tools for for generating the bindings, and and then typically it's a process of going along behind the generated bindings and saying, this is not quite how you would expect the C-Sharp API to look like. So we go through and we refine it and we polish it, bring in, bring in async, you know, and, and APs that, APIs that, that need to be asyncified. Or um, if, if developers would expect a, a, a more of a, a delegate model for raising events or whatever, then, you know, we, we go and try to bring in the C-Sharp behaviors that, uh, that we, would think our developers would expect to see on top of that. Okay. Um, what's really neat is Xamarin was, of course, a proprietary solution for the past five plus years. Um, but with Microsoft's acquisition of Xamarin, they open sourced everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so if you know if you watched it all in GitHub, you could actually see this 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 whole binding process, you know, take place in public um, as we've moved into this this you know more open open source model. Um, you know, we're not just we're not just dumping these out there. Um, you know, we encourage the community to come participate. So if I find a bug in a particular uh, implementation of a, of a UI widget that's, that, uh, that maybe something was missed and yeah. I find that bug and I, I, can I create a pull request back to the project? Yes. But yeah, we please do. Yeah. Oh. So we would love to have those. Um, and, and then also, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's nice to be in a situation where we have a community that's anxious to have this kind of help. And if, an, and if, uh, if, if Google, um, you know, drops a new preview of of the next version of of Android, and there are an API that you're really anxious to try. We'll come jump in. You know, we're there to help tell you how to, uh, um, you know, how to take advantage of that API and start binding it, and and uh, and, and get involved with the community. So if that that's excellent to hear, especially since it's open source now that you can actually hop in and and contribute back to this project that so many folks are using. So just to be clear, if if we do have that new version of Android that comes out and it does have a new UI widget, that's your team of engineers are going to hop in there and basically create that binding so you can expose it inside of Xamarin, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's our priority to make sure it's not only exposed, but that it's a, it's a beautiful looking API that developers want to use. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but you're, you know, you're absolutely free to, you know, go bind it yourself, maybe not contribute it back if you think, you know, we're going to do it anyways. And you just, you want a quick and dirty hack to be able to try something out. Yeah. You can do that as well. What's the average turnaround time that you guys usually have when a new release is pushed out before it's kind of available to the public? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so we have a, we have an, an excellent track record with iOS of, um, of tracking these things very closely. Um, Android we have, um, we've gotten much better. So we haven't, um, you know, w- with iOS, I don't think we've ever you know, when iOS gives a nice long lead time, where in the summer at WWDC you start seeing previews that we can start tracking with our own previews, and by the time they get close to to GM, um, we have everything bound and and you know most of the kinks worked out, and people can start submitting apps to the App Store before before the iOS release. Oh wow! Okay. Um, on the Android side, we've historically lagged more behind just because of the adoption curve of new versions of Android. Um, it, it it hasn't been as pressing that um that we track that as closely we've never gotten really publicly dinged for not um for not tracking as closely as well but um but the nice thing is is that as we've gotten more developers on board we've we've had more customers and isds um that that, you know even google cares about so they have a vested interest in in seeing us um able to support those new apis soon as well because they want to they want to push adoption of new versions so um i don't think we're quite the same day yet but i think we're 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 in a position to be close. Um, and would you say it's within a month or, or two months or, I mean, uh, I just was, I was shying away from that because I don't, I don't remember, um, what the exact, um, what the exact period was on the, on the latest release. I know that we got, I I know that we got, I would say a year ago, I think we were close to with, within, within days. And then we might. That's amazing though, right there. I mean, days is, 
I, I personally, I don't have a problem when a company is, especially when you're, you're, you're creating this bridge between these two different languages and these platforms, a couple of days to me, like, okay, yeah. I can't wait. You're, if I'm a C-sharp developer and I used to be on many C-sharp teams uh, and I need to support the new version of Android, okay, I can probably wait a couple of days mm -hmm. uh, afterwards. Again, I know there's other people that feel differently, but for me, I don't see why it's a humongous problem. But the fact that you guys are trying to push forward is, is, is great. Yeah. And, and, you know, with a the community there and, and that being a priority and people that care about native, I mean, it certainly, certainly pushes it forward. You mentioned a second, something about called Xamarin forms. And yesterday here at the Microsoft event, which we're, right now we're in the Microsoft offices uh, in New York city at the connect event, they were out there saying that they had the shared libraries, like we talked about earlier, and then they had used Xamarin forms to build this application out, basically allowing for over 90, 95%. And they, they were just round numbers uh, of code sharing between the platforms. What is Xamarin forms? And if I'm an Xamarin developer, well, why should I care about it? Right. So, you know, so from, from day one, we kept telling uh, developers that you should be creating native experiences. And, and lots of times businesses would be coming back to developers saying, we really want you to just write it once. Right. Uh, so Xamarin Forms is basically a library at the end of the day. It's a library that we created to fit that need of giving developers the ability to do right once run anywhere with Xamarin okay. when they needed to without necessarily giving away uh, or giving up completely on the ability to, to, to do native things. So Xamarin Forms is, is an abstraction that gives you, um, you know, layouts and controls, a toolkit for, for writing cross-platform apps and you can share up to 100% of code um, and depending on the kind of app you want. Between platforms, iOS and Android. iOS, Android and, and, and Windows UWP. Oh, wow. Um, so the, you know, the, the trade-off is just less control over exactly how it gets rendered, but it is, it is still an, an abstraction. So it's still native rendering. So you make a native, uh, you make a Xamarin Forms app, you design, you define a layout and, um, and then Xamarin Forms decides, you know, how to, how to, um, you know, use a native button and use a native text box. And, um, so you end up with a, you end up with native look and feel that maybe you don't, you don't quite have the, um, you know, like I said, the complete control to say, this is the native behavior I expected, but what, what you do have, um, what Xamarin forms is, is, you know, designed was to keep that native, those native capabilities at, at arm's length. So with the first release of Xamarin Forms, we had this idea of custom renderer. So as soon as you realize, oh, I need this screen to be native, mm -hmm. well, we're going to give you the ability to put a native screen in there. And what you saw James demonstrate on stage yesterday was uh, where we've where we've made native embedding even easier. So instead of I having to that. figure out what a custom renderer is or how I should go about writing one, which is probably you know creating a new class and extending something or whatever, the native embedding. Let me just take a step back real quick. Yeah. Xamarin Forms layout is is done in, in XAML. So that's another XML format separate of iOS storyboards or Android XML. Um, so, you know, typically if you're doing your UI in Xamarin Forms, it's, you can write it in C Sharp, um, but you can also do it declaratively in, in, in XAML. And, um, and what James showed was, you know, in his example, he took a, a segment, an iOS segment in control. So that's the control I want that's iOS specific, but I want it in the middle of the Xamarin Forms page. So in the, in the XAML, he, he just was able to start a new tag that says, give me the iOS segment of control right here. And on Android, that's nothing that's ignored. It doesn't exist, but on iOS, it's going to render that control. Is there a way inside of XAML that I can say, maybe I've built a custom, a nice little custom UI widget for Android and for iOS that has certain behavior for our particular business needs. Is there a way in XAML to say, hey, if we're running Android, show this one. And if we're running iOS, show this one? Yeah, absolutely. And that is what the custom renderer is. Okay. Right. So um, so with the custom renderer, you tell you tell Xamarin Forms at the shared code level, I'm gonna need uh, you know, uh, my my custom pie chart, right? I've written a custom custom pie chart that that renders in the way my business wants it. And uh and on on iOS, that is you know, that is rendered in one way and on Android, it's rendered in another. And in the shared code level, all you know is that give me the thing that on this platform is the pie chart. Mm -hmm. And, and that's how Xamarin forms itself works under the cover. We just give you a lot of, a lot of renders, There's a lot of abstractions pack, top. packaged in. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but the community out there has, has created many custom controls of their own. And that's how you, how you go about doing that. 
Okay. So, that, you know, to bring it for, again, for the listeners from, you know, top to bottom, if this really gives us, if we start at the bottom, actually, it's, we have the, the shared libraries. We talked to our API, we have our authentication that's shared across iOS and Android, you know, business logic. It's one place that's shared and so forth. And then from there, we can kind of uh, now even introduce this new layer, which is the like Xamarin forms, which allows us to write basically our UI once, right? Uh, to display it on various different platforms. And then on top of that, we have our independent platforms themselves, Android and iOS. And that kind of almost reduces that layer to a much thinner surface area. Would you, right. would you agree? Right, that's the that's the objective. Um, and um, basically, I mean, I, I have very little and Android specific code and I have very little iOS specific code and the rest of it is basically shared. Right, yeah. And again, I mean, you know, we're, we're developers and and we recognize you know the productivity benefits that the developers want to get from sharing code um and and what the business you know wants to see by telling us to share code so for Xamarin forms we want to make that possible mm -hmm. but at the same time like recognizing that you might put the app in the hands of users and they're like this is not the behavior i was expecting you know when i'm running my my other android apps they do the right thing why is you know why can't you do this and you're not we don't want the developers to be stuck with an abstraction where like, well, that's just, that's just what you get. Mm -hmm. And instead to be able to give the, the developers the power to always come back and, and put some native polish on it. And, and uh, yeah. So that means a floating that, action button. Or, exactly. So that means on, on Android, this is a big thing. If I want to implement the material design guidelines, I can then implement the material design guidelines, maybe with some custom renderers or, or whatever of that nature. So on Android, I have that full, nice fluid motion, ripple effects, all that kind of stuff. And then for iOS, I can have the, I mean, I'm not an iOS developer, so I don't know the exact terms over there, but I can implement everything iOS style over there as well. Correct. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, that's that's the, the power we want we want to put in developers' hands. Excellent. Which kind of you know, brings up the, the point that uh, Kaushik really wanted me to ask this question is, is can you build really complex apps with Xamarin or are you kind of, are you shoehorned into just creating simple applications that are, you know, forms over data? Yeah, right. So I think that, um, you know, that is the leading question for Xamarin forms. And, and sometimes developers come at this and they only try the Xamarin forms approach and Xamarin forms has the same name as Xamarin. So I do think it's nice to be able to speak specifically to this, to this topic, to you and your listeners. Yeah. Um, because that's a that's a perception that that might be true with Xamarin Forms. Like it's good for forms over data apps, and and it has it, you know it's powerful for other things as well, and it's good for prototyping. But it's not the right solution for everything. But but with Xamarin itself, I mean the functionality is it's it you know it's better than than just toy. I mean like we not only want you to be able to build any kind of app you you want but we want your apps to be better because you were able to be more productive with C-sharp mm -hmm. and Visual Studio um, and, and, and share that code in more places so you can spend more time doing new features rather than implementing the same feature twice. And, uh, and I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's powerful, it's performant. Uh, C-sharp powers a, a lot of games. It's, it's big in VR and AR. And all of that functionality being able to be back in the hands of app developers, that power, um, it's much more than just toy apps. So if I wanted to, be, uh, for example, I just recently got done with a, uh, a client project the last couple of months building a fitness application. And that fitness application uh, played audio classes uh, through a, uh, one of actually Google released a audio player called Exo Player, um, which is a very configurable audio player for Android. And we needed that because we needed to control buffering and all this kind of different stuff. Based on what we talked about before, I can still use that library for Android. Um, and then with, with Xamarin, I can still connect to that library and do the audio playback and everything. Correct? That, that yeah, absolutely. Correct? Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, the situation you're then in is, is finding that equivalent library over on the iOS side mm -hmm. if you want to have that functionality over there, if you're going to deliver an app there. Um, but, uh, but I can build those, like those, those media playback yeah, absolutely. applications. And I'm, I'm not just limited, like we said, to the, to the forms. It says Xamarin forms, but I'm not just shoehorned into like, well, here's these X amount of controls. I actually have those. And then if I actually want to hop into fine grain Android, I can go back to the fine grain Android stuff and do that too. Exactly. Okay. What, what companies are using Xamarin right now? Like what apps maybe we know about or what companies would be, be familiar with? Right. So. I mean, two of my favorite examples lately are um, uh, Alaska Air, um, several airlines. Um, I think it's it's popular with, um, I mean, a lot of businesses are going mobile. So a lot of the stories I keep hearing about are from 
um, like shipping companies putting devices in the in the you know in the hands of field uh, you know workers or field mm-hmm. engineers. Um, one of my w- one of my favorite stories recently um, has been Outback Steakhouse. Though, okay. um, if you if you look at the Outback Steakhouse app, that you know they've written an app in Xamarin that is a it's a five star app. Um, and uh, and what's great about it is you know well, they deliver steaks right now. We can have them. <laughs> I bet, I bet. No, what the what the app does that's great is I mean like every restaurant has an app these days. It's yeah. kind of like a web page. You you know you got to put some information on a page so. People know where to call to make reservations and get directions and see the menu. But um, but what Outback did is they, you know, they looked at, well, hey, you have this device in your hand and how can we how can we provide a better experience to customers through the fact that everybody has a mobile app? And, it, and the app's reviewed very well, not only because it's native and provides a pleasant experience, because, but it lets you do cool things like you can just pay directly from your phone. So you're oh, not waiting for the server. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So, um, and uh, that's kind of transformative to business. And, you know, those those are the things that make being in this space now with native app development, you know, fun a fun place to be. If, I think one of the, well, I don't, I don't think, I know for a fact, when, when I, I work with a lot of startups and I get courted from a lot of startups, they ask me a question. Uh, and this question is, should we use Xamarin? Um, or should we go, should we use Xamarin or PhoneGap, uh, or, you know, React Native? Um, to be honest, I don't have any experience with PhoneGap or React Native other than just kind of perusing the documentation. I've actually built apps with Xamarin so I can speak to it, but that's the question I get asked a lot of the times. Um, and I, I know that you're going to be biased with the, 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 the question, but what is your response to that when a company does come to you? Do yeah. you have like a set of parameters that you're like, well, in this case, you probably want to go native or in this case, uh, yeah, you want to go Xamarin or is it always Xamarin or what's, what's your thought on that? Yeah, no, I'm incredibly biased, but let me at least give you the justifications for yeah. being biased. Um, you know, if I'm being asked to compare to those other solutions you mentioned, like, you know, Cordova, mm-hmm. PhoneGap, mm-hmm. React Native, um, those, all of those fall into a, in, into a class of, of APIs that, um, Closer, frankly, to, you know, at, at, at best, the Xamarin Forms experience, right? It's, um, you know, in the world today, you've been given a limited set of APIs that are available to build apps in a React way. And React, you know, React Native offers a nice way to build apps. And if you like JavaScript, I mean, it, it's, it's popular for a reason. It, I mean, it lets you do some, some cool things, and it also makes for great demos. Um, I'm biased towards C sharp because I think it's a more powerful language. Um, but at the end of the day, despite the name react native is not this 100% mapping of, of native APIs okay. that, that Xamarin gives you. So, so Xamarin is, you know, I fully think, 100% mapping the API landscape. Right. Yeah. So that you're, you're never caught in an abstraction where, you know, Oh, I need that. Have. And I can't get to it. Yeah. Now, um, the, the other, you know, the other place where we're typically competing for, you know, where people are deciding is, okay, well, I mean, it's only two platforms. I don't like writing it in two different code bases, but it is only Objective C or Swift and Java. Um, And, um, you know, I, you know, maybe I'm, I, I'm being compared to that, right? So we've decided we need a native experience. And the question is, can we share code or do we even care about it? And what's interesting is lots of times people will end up with an iOS specific app or a Java specific app, because that was the requirement of the time. Oh, we're buying iPads and I know I'm writing an iOS app. So I'm just going to use Objective-C or I'm just going to use Swift because like it's, it's the iPad today. But then, you know, six months later, you're done with the iPad app and everybody's pleased with it. And you have a new app and it's Android um, or it's Android and iOS. And so suddenly it is cross platform and you're, and you're, wow, I wish I could use some of that code that I had before, especially if it's things like, oh, I just wrote authentication for that, that app on the iPad. And now I'm again, going to be writing authentication and all these web service calls and all my data synchronization. (laughs) And it's a totally different app, except that it's not because it's still the same models and I'm still using the same business objects that I was using in that other app. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it's not, I'm not necessarily a cross-platform developer because I'm not writing a, a single app cross-platform, but over the course of a year, I am a cross-platform developer because I keep having to write for these, for this platform, then that platform, mm-hmm. and then I'm bringing it back to the web. And, you know, you know, it's when you're in that mode, when you're, when you're writing apps that, that you realize that cross-platform is more than just trying to write one app for multiple platforms. Let's say that I, I 
you know, after hearing this, this interview, I go take a look at Xamarin. I'm, you know, I'm an engineer, engineering manager, whatever. I go in there, I was like, all right, you know, this looks like something that's interesting to me or my team. And I want us to take it. I want to take us there. We already have an existing Android application. What, how do we go from having that current native Java Android app to Xamarin? Is there any help getting into to Xamarin from that? Well, I mean, there is help. And there's also just the fact that Java is kind of approachable. Um, and and hopefully by now you kind of understand the um, structure of the uh, of um, of Xamarin yeah. compared to, to Android with Java is um, a lot of similarities beyond just the language. You're using that same Android XML. It, a lot of it depends on the size and complexity of the app you have and, yeah. and what you want to, what your objective is when you get to the other side. And it probably needs to be decided on a case by case basis. But, you know, at a minimum, you should enter it thinking, oh, I could, I could file new app, copy over my Android XML resources, everything that, you know, everything that's not the, the code, I could copy that into my Android, my new Android, Xamarin Android project. And, um, expect to be able to leverage that that's not being rewritten and then i could take java and i could copy that and you know it, it would be perhaps a little tedious i'm sure you can find lots of tools out there that'll convert java to c sharp um, so you could convert the code and then lastly you know we get back to that story about bindings and being able to leverage native libraries you could just take the and the, the the java you've already written keep that compiled as a jar save that porting for later make yeah. sure you're even committed to moving over and, you know, add some Xamarin, you know, functionality and, and use those two things. Just kind of see side. if it works, kind of kick the tires a little bit. Yep. Okay, cool. All right. That makes sense. And I mean, that, that seems like a, a very viable approach, especially if I can compile it, at least the non-Android stuff down into a, to a jar to reuse it. That would, I think, save a lot of pain and apprehension that some folks might have about transitioning over if they have a, a larger existing project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now here's the, the, the million dollar question. If I'm developing for Xamarin, it's C sharp. Let's, let's be honest. It's, Everybody thinks C sharp. Everyone thinks Windows. Can't do I have to go buy a Windows machine to do this, or where can I develop this, or what do I need? Well, that is that is a great question. So you need a you. I mean, if if you're going to develop Android, um, you can do it on Windows or or Mac today. Um, we have the full you know the full tool chain now open source. You you could even you know with a lot less of the IDE conveniences. Okay. You could even do a lot of it on Linux if that's if that's what you want. Oh wow. Do. Okay. But from our tooling perspective, um, you know if you if you're on and if you're on Mac or Windows, it's um, uh, it's not going to be that difference. We have you know Visual Studio on Windows, of course, and then yesterday we announced uh, Visual Studio for Mac, which is which is taking um, you know what was previously Xamarin Studio, which was a very mobile specific um, IDE mm -hmm. that's very Visual Studio like, and beginning to bring Visual Studio functionality into it, so that you're not just writing mobile apps, but you're also writing uh, you're able to write your your ASP.NET Core backends inside the same IDE and share that code. Um, so and that'll, yeah. run, that'll run on, on, on Unix based systems now too, with the announcements that were made yesterday that the .NET will run on those. Unix yeah, based exactly. Systems. Yeah. So you can deploy, you know, you can deploy your backends to Linux. Okay, oh, cool, um, cool. doesn't matter. Um, and so the last real question I have here, are there any real gotchas about Xamarin that we don't know about? Is there anything that we should be aware of when we're getting into Xamarin as developers? Well, way to, way to end it on a happy note. No, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> You know, I think that, you know, the kinds of challenges that I see people hitting, you know, today, frankly, um, are that um, they're very different than what they were a few years ago. I mean, we used to get dinged on the size of the runtime, but now apps are so big mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the mono runtime adds, you know, a couple of megs. It's smaller than most of your That's other That's a good assets. question. How much does it add? Is it just a couple of megs? Well, it starts, yeah, it starts at about, um, well, it used to be four megs. I think we're under that. We're, we're constantly okay. trying to trim that down. Um, and then we use a linker to, uh, to, you know, you bring in portions of .NET libraries you're using and we link away the por portions you're not. So, you know, we give you the minimal amount of, of Xamarin and Xamarin libraries that you need to support your app. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's that's adding some size on. And I think that, you know, people still look at that. So you have to be aware that that's coming in there. You know, I think that just to interject with the, your sizing comment there, yeah. um, a lot of folks listen to this and they they worry about this on, on Fragmented. They worry about the size of their Android application. They worry about how many methods that they have. Uh, and it, it turns into a big, like almost like religious war inside of Android itself. Personally, uh, I am very pragmatic about the situation. And if I can gain uh, a ton of productivity by using a different tool, be it Xamarin or whatever, and it's going to cost me a few megs. And this happens too with Realm, which I think Realm recently came out with support for, for Xamarin as well. Um, 
and realm ads, you know, Meg's on my, my APK. At the end of the day, I don't care because it's allowing me to ship my fast, my app faster, um, much more productive. So a couple of Meg's are really not that big of a deal. And I think people really need to recognize that when they're building something in, not focus on these minute details and tear something apart because, oh, it's adding a couple of Meg's, you know, there's, there's something we refer to as the power of defaults. Um, you know, we give you defaults that make things work mm-hmm. um, that can always be tuned later, right? Yeah. So you can choose the, you know, the ARM, you know, uh, processors you're targeting that you want to have, yeah. you know, compiled in support for API levels. Um, so, you know, I, I think I pretty much agree with you that, you know, on the runtime side, I don't think you should sweat it. And then the challenges of large Android apps are something that hits everybody regardless of if you're using that framework. And and, and we're all learning together what the you know what the the strategies are to to reduce that for for late loading and yep. you know you know those we all share in those and in, and in, and in figuring that stuff out together i yeah i i would hope you know if you're pragmatic and yeah i think you should be this is not something you should be sweating um, um if folks want to get started with xamarin uh where where should they go to get started with it how, how do they learn more about it where do they go to download it what is what's that look like yeah so i mean there's, of course, xamarin.com slash download. You can okay. get, uh, you know, Visual Studio or um, it, our, our ID, Xamarin Studio on, on, on Mac directly from there. We have a developer portal, developer.xamarin.com, with tons of, of um, great documentation. Very, very proud of the, the work we put into the documentation there. Um, we have Xamarin University. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Xamarin University was, you know, prior to acquisition, a, uh, a, a fairly expensive um, service to um, to provide a lot of great instruction mm-hmm. for learning Xamarin development and mobile development in general with Xamarin. And uh, that continues to exist and it's still a great product. But one thing we've, we've, we've been doing in the past months is turning some of that content into self-guided learning. So that's, that's a really great place to start. Um, you can learn a lot about mobile development, development with C-sharp and just getting started with Xamarin, um, you know, by, by checking out Xamarin University as well. Excellent. I think it's important to note to, to the listeners too. We are a, again a very heavily focused Android podcast. We're all Java developers here. The thing that I wanted to to make a note of is that uh, I have been part of a company in uh, in Minnesota for for years, and it's a gaming company. And we recently went through a big rewrite. Everything was actually all native. Was Objective C. It was Android Java, uh, and we actually rewrote everything in Xamarin. And so I don't think folks should dismiss this because it's a Microsoft product. I think it's a very viable product. It's one that I have used previous all the way back to when it was just called Monotouch. Uh, it saved me a lot of time in developing applications like that. And if folks are having problems building applications or doing cross-platform stuff, running into weird platform bugs over here, but not over here. Um, I mean, we're going to run those bugs regardless, but if you're running in the business logic issues and so forth, Xamarin, uh, and the forms and everything, it's definitely worth taking a look at. So and this is from my own personal experience. So, um, it, it's been fantastic. Is there anything that you'd like to share with the, the listeners here before we, we wrap up? Well, I would just piggyback off the end of what you're saying there. We have a, we have a community that's been great and very passionate for, for the, for the years we've been around. Um, and, uh, you know, that's large and growing, has been growing at a healthy clip up until when Microsoft acquired us and um, made everything not only free, but open source Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that, that grew our community by, by multiples. So, you know, it's a, it's a great time to get involved. There's lots of other people learning it at the same time. If people, you know, people have always had concerns that there's this company with a commercial product and they're charging a lot for it and that could go away. Do I want to stake my you know, my business on this. And, and now it's, it's, uh, you know, it's such a big part of what we're doing with visual studio. And, and of course on the Microsoft side with Azure, um, that, uh, you know, that's really brought down barriers for a lot of people to adopt it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it's, it's been great for the community and, and, you know, we'd love to have, uh, um, you know, just any, you know, like I said, any developers that care about, you know, C sharp being a great language aside, uh, cross-platform, uh, you know, cross-platform challenges we're all facing. Um, I think we have a good approach for it. If folks want to get a hold of you through Twitter, what's the the best way to do that? Are you on Twitter? I am Twitter. Uh, I am I am on Twitter. <laughs> I am Twitter. I am Joseph Hill on Twitter. Uh, all one word. And uh, you, you can also email me. I'm jhill at microsoft.com. But yeah, I, uh, I love I love Twitter. I have a lot of fun there. 
Okay, great. Well, we appreciate you coming on the show. This has been super informative. This has actually been a, actually a requested topic quite a few times uh, over the last year. Uh, a lot of folks want to hear about cross-platform development, Xamarin, what we think about it. This has been a phenomenal, like really good, like deep dive into what Xamarin is and so forth. I can't say thanks enough. I know if Kaushik was here, he would say the same thing. Thank you for coming on the show, Joseph. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I hope your audience enjoys this. And and if they do, uh, we got lots of great, great people in the community you, sh- you should uh, have on your show and in, in, in the future. Thanks, Joseph. Yeah, thanks. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit all of the Fragmented episodes ourselves. The amazing Sarah from Spec helps us with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme music and ad music is produced by the cool cat, Alan Taylor. You can find more episodes of the show on Pocket Casts, Google Play Music, or any of the other great podcast players in town. Our website is fragmentedpodcast.com, and you can find the links to all the stuff we say on our website. Thank you all for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.